My name's Kristen. I'm with PRI, and I'm gonna let um, I'm gonna let these guys introduce themselves here. We'll start with Bob Sargent. My name is Bob Sargent. Um, we operate out of central Illinois and have stretched into about 14 different states. So a lot of different events um, from ARCA to the World of Outlaws to four cylinders on a weekly quarter mile, fifth mile racetrack. So a lot of variety in what we do and just kind of here to go over Christian's schedule and take question and answers. Thank you, Bob. Uh, my name's Bill Bader. Um, I own and operate Summit Motorsports Park in Norwalk, Ohio. Uh, I started in this business um, in 1977, and I just completed my 41st year. I uh, had the good fortune to have an absolutely fabulous mentor in my father, Bill Bader Sr. And um, to be very honest with you, I'm very uh, excited, very optimistic, very bullish on the future of motorsports. I think we have tremendous opportunities. I think we're the last great undiscovered uh, American-made sport uh, in the infancy phase of our product life cycle. And I think if we go about our business um, in the right way collectively as an industry, um, I think we have nothing but extraordinary growth and opportunity in the future. Good morning. I'm Steve Beiler with Fun Time Promotions. I live up in the uh, northwest United States in the state of Washington. Um, this is uh, my 45th year of being involved in motorsports. Clear back to high school, started racing, uh, raced professionally for many years with World of Outlaws. I've toured here, been in Mexico, raced over in Australia, and then was in the parts business for several years, and I bought racetracks about 18 years ago. I started with my first one, and I currently operate Skagit Speedway, Northwest Washington, um, Grays Harbor Raceway in Southwest Washington, and the uh, State Fair Park over in Eastern Washington. In addition to the three dirt tracks, I also have two traveling series that I manage that race throughout Washington and Oregon. So we just pretty much do roundy round stuff. Good morning, my name is Tommy Franklin with the Virginia Motorsports Park. We're uh, just south of Richmond in Dinwiddie, Virginia. Um, it's actually my first year of ownership, just completed a first year of ownership. But uh, we have a quarter mile drag racing facility as well as a uh, dirt track, uh, more of the monster truck, uh, truck and tractor pulls, and a motocross facility as well. In addition to that, we have a uh, racing series, the PDRA, that's kind of a traveling series that goes across uh, you know, different tracks across the uh, country. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we're going to start with you know, the, the, the guest experience. So how important is that, and what can we do to improve it? Well, from a guest service perspective, um, I think it is absolutely positively paramount to our long-term success. Um, first of all, and it was something that we were discussing, a archaic concept was that um, racetracks in the same state, racetracks uh, next to one another uh, were competitors, and we're not competitors. Um, we, whether we're a quarter mile, whether we're an eighth mile, whether we're a half mile oval, whether we're a, I don't know, I heard two round track guys arguing one time outside a conference room about which was longer. Um, it was either a three eighths or I don't remember a half or something. And, uh, but the point is, um, we need racetracks. Um, and whether it's Virginia, you're a quarter mile track, which is 1,320 feet long, I'm a quarter mile track, 1,320 feet long. I'm 60 feet wide. How are you? 60 feet wide. Um, we both have CompuLink timing systems. We both have NHRA national events. So how do we distinguish ourselves? Um, and more specifically, since we're not competitors of one another, um, who, who, uh, who do we compete with? Well, we compete with Disney. We compete with the NFL. We compete with Major League Baseball. We comp compete with the NBA, the NHL, uh, minor league stick and ball sports. We compete with every movie goer. So um, what are their experiences like? When, when you go to a major league stick and ball venue, there are certain creature comfort features that are expected. Last time I knew, most of us are still using porta johns. Last time I knew, some of us, us included, are still selling out of aprons. Um, we're, we're out in the heat. When the heat index is 115, we've got 30,000 aluminum seats that people are sitting in. They're not in a climate-controlled arena. 
So we must excel at taking care of our guest because all of the major league properties around us are. Here's the big difference. We're available. Tommy Franklin is in his pit area. I'm sure you gentlemen are, are in your infield or in your pit area. I'm in my pit area. I'm available. Um, so from, a, from an accessibility perspective, I'm not sure I've ever seen an NFL owner out and about where I could walk up to him and say, don't you know how to run a football team? Um, uh, I, I, I'm near Cleveland, Ohio, enough said. But the, 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 the point is, we have an opportunity to have an intimate relationship with our guest. We can know them by name, we can shake their hand, we can thank them for coming, we can develop a rapport with them, we watch their kids grow up through our youth programs like Junior Dragster or Junior Street. So to me, the single greatest tool that we have in our toolbox is our ability to take care of our guest, to service our guest, to make our guest feel special. And that is a point of differentiation that we can excel at. My last quick story, a couple years ago, we went to the Toledo Zoo to see the lights at Christmas time. The backup was ridiculous. And I'm, I'm in the car with my family and a anticipation is high and my wife's having a meltdown and we, get, we wait hours and we finally get to the ticket booth and they said, I'm sorry, we're closed. And then, they, and then somebody came in and said, no, if you can find a parking spot, you're fine. Go ahead. So now we had waited and waited and waited. We finally um, were able to park. And Jamie was really frustrated because she was misinformed. She had called the office. Um, and so they, went, they directed us to guest service. People there were indifferent, could, could have cared less. Um, we, she took the time to fill out a form and never heard from anybody. Um, and quite frankly, I have no interest. I didn't want to go to begin with. However, um, why would I go back there? You know. Um, so how are we going about our business? How are we taking care of our guests? How, are, how important are they to us? Are they important to our face? And then when we turn our back on them, uh, screw it. He's just a, you know, a racer who doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, so we must, customer is king. Customer is king. Uh, you can't lose if the customer wins. So we have very much at Summit Motorsports Park a guest first mentality. Yeah, I think um, as, he, as Bill was speaking, if anyone new in here for sure, but even old because I may have to revisit, but one of the things that made the biggest impression on myself for the customer experience was I started in 1985, I was literally 20 to 21 years old. I switched right there when I got started in this. So um, somewhere in the first five years, we were a NASCAR track, and I think Tom might have been involved, but we took a back scenes tour at Disney. And that, to this day, still probably resonates in my mind, how they did business, how they treated the customer, the cleanliness, just everything about what they do. So the moral of that is, um, you know, I do a lot of, you know, reaching out or paying attention to the other industries, whether it be hockey, Major League Baseball, what the NFL is doing with their cheerleaders, their excitement, all that's a fan experience all the way down. Another thing that always impressed me was the time schedule that these venues had, you know, the, the other sports, the, the national sports and things of that nature. So not that NASCAR doesn't do a great job in HRA, but, uh, you know, we, we I encourage my employees and myself constantly to watch – what the other um, venues are doing for the fan experience. And that even goes all the way to restaurants, department stores. You know, technology is such a big thing. We'll go about that a little bit. But, you know, this is a big new world that we're all living in. And, and I think the racetracks, luckily the people that are here are, are probably going to advance. But we see and you hear all the time about our facilities across the United States probably not being up and, and being taken care of. And I think that's the main thing about the fan experience is there's plenty of examples around us what other venues and other sports are doing. And then you can always look back on yourself, as, as Bill said, his, his personal experience, you know, what your kids like, what your wife likes. That's a good, uh, you know, cross-section of what our fans probably enjoy. But it's pretty basic common sense, again want clean they want exciting they they want that five to ten year old kid to be happy when he's there and be you know treated with something the adults want more of a uh, an experience of the what they came to to buy that chick whether it was a drag race or a circle race so 
you know, just a, a real common sense approach to fan experience is probably the best way. In the short track world, one of the big advantages we have is that we are accessible. I mean, your fans can reach out to the racers before and after the races, and the fan experience is important, but you got to have a good balance in it. I've been to racetracks that, you know, you go there and they're just, there's nothing going on. The cars come on the track, they race, they go off, and it's just, it's almost boring. I've been to other racetracks to where they go too far. They got too much dog and pony show going on throughout the night that they forget that these people came here to see a race. So it's, it's a delicate balancing act when you're trying to entertain the fans to where you want to give them the, the main show they come from, but you want to give them all the trimmings around that to where they've got a great experience coming in before the races. They get a little bit of entertainment during the races. They got a good experience when they're leaving. Probably one of the best things that I try to teach all our employees is be the customer. Look at everything through the customer's eyes. When you drive off the highway, what do you want to see? How do you want to be treated? What do you expect? And that's what you got to give them. And I, I think it's really important that you got to get out and get amongst them too. Early in the night, you want to be in your, uh, your pit area, just walking around, observing, looking, listening, talking to the racers, because they're your customers. In the, uh, once the race venue gets started, don't go up and hide in the suites or in the control tower. Get out in the grandstands. Don't be afraid to walk around, sit in the different grandstands, talk to people, but walk around and look and observe. The other thing that's important in the fan experience is your facility. Clean, cleanliness is number one. You know, make it look nice, paint all the basic, simple stuff you do. But if you're going to spend money someplace, the two areas you really want to spend money on at your facility, the first area is the bathrooms. I mean, if you ever drove down the freeway and went into a gas station and the bathrooms are just horrible, you're not going to take care of them either, so why would you expect your guests and you don't want to go back there? Second place is your concession stands. You want to make it appetizing when they walk in or they want to buy food. They feel confident and comfortable buying food. So you want to make sure that their total experience is good, but you also want to stay focused on the, the program you're doing each night. The last thing I want to talk about, too, is when you're dealing with fans, you're going to have a lot of diehard fans that are in their 60s, 70, 80 year old. You've got to cater to those people. You've got your 30 to 50 year old fans. You've got to be able to cater to them, but you've also got your young people clear down to five, six, seven years old, you need to cater to all of them. So you need to be aware of all the different ages and not cater to one or the other with everything from the music you play to, you know, the way the announcer talks and some of the specials you do. And we've got everything from kids clubs. We've got a really organized beer garden. We've also got a family section, no smoking, no drinking in those areas. So you got to give everybody a place to be where they feel comfortable and if you're, uh, if you're a single mom with your 11-year-old daughter, I want you to feel perfectly safe and comfortable coming to any one of my racetracks and having an enjoyable experience. So we really work hard on all the, all the aspects and not just focus on how many beers we can sell to that 30 to 50-year-old crowd. You want to make it safe and, uh, and comfortable for everybody. I, uh, just, just like a lot of these guys just said, the, uh, you know, the experience at that that customer has to walk in the door and feel comfortable and feel like uh, they fit there and that they're wanted there, I think is the biggest key. One of the things that we can do better with that, I think all the time is communication with our employees to make sure everybody's on that same page, just to make sure that, you know, everybody's welcome there. Um, and, and I'm, you know, very guilty of looking around at the other venues that do it, such as, you know, when you were competing with a baseball stadium and things like that, because they do such a good job of, keeping those people, get them in, get them happy, um, and leave. One of the challenges we have, obviously, with that is being outdoor, uncovered, temperatures, you know, things like that. So I, I think that that just means we have to be a, another level of good to be able to do that, you know, because we all know that you can come to a, a drag racing event and come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, we're expecting them to stay till 11 o'clock at night. So it's kind of hard to do that. So we kind of got to carve out the show and, you know, we always have our diehards, but I think the biggest key is just to, uh, you know, tell them what time they can be there, tell them what time we can give them the show, and then deliver that to them, um, you know, and, and really just uh, provide the experience. You know, I, I watched, uh, we had a monster truck <coughs> event last year, and I literally watched people pile in within 20, 30 minutes, have the event, hour and 45 minutes later, pile out, and they're happy as could be. And it's like, okay, they don't need eight hours of entertainment, you know, so that was, uh, it, it's, it's a whole different view of looking at it. Um, I definitely agree as well on the, uh, 
restrooms into concessions. You know, we're a, a drag racing event, a, you know, truck pull event. It's not the same as it used to where, you know, the, the level of expectancy is a lot higher now. Um, you know, so I, I think we just have to continue to uh, keep up with what we're dealing with. And I think a good, you know, I think everybody knows um, you know, the Chick-fil-A experience. You know, you go through the Chick-fil-A experience and they're very good um, about making you happy, making you feel welcome there. And I think that's just uh, some of the things we have to follow as well. Can, can I, I want to just comment additionally on a couple of comments. Um, he talked about women. 48% um, of the kids born in this country are born to a single parent, okay? So understanding that, one in two. So we're not marketing to dad anymore. Dad's not around. Um, and in the 52% in, in the of the households that he is, God bless him. But we need to look at our facilities and say, not only are they fan friendly, but are they female friendly? Um, do you have pregnancy parking at your racetrack? Um, that's a big deal. Do you have family seating at your racetrack? That's a big deal. Um, you know, guest service, it by and large, is free. It doesn't, if you're paying somebody $10 an hour to work a position at your racetrack, why not hire a friendly person at $10 an hour versus someone who is indifferent or could care less about being there or is only there because it's supplemental income. Um, our philosophy is hire a nice person and teach them the job. Hire a nice person and teach them how to tech a car. Don't hire a technician and try to teach them to be nice. You can't do that, you can't teach nice. It's God made, not man made. Um, so guest service by and large is pretty free. Um, and we need to remember that everything we're doing when we're showing our crash and burn videos Sunday, 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 come to Summit Motorsports Park and watch 300-mile-an-hour cars slam into each other. I don't know. Does that seem friendly to a single mom who potentially is worried about debris flying into the grandstands and hitting her children? Um, showing, it was just two years ago that NHRA had a commercial that showed these big busted women in tight shirts with big necklaces that said candy on them, and I'm thinking, really? We, we have not evolved past this yet? Um, so w needless to say, we took that out of our commercial. But the point is, we have to understand half our households, we are speaking to women, and we need to craft our messaging and, and control the narrative accordingly. I would encourage each person to um, be a customer at your racetrack. Okay, and all of your key staff or all of your staff, your team, your, that's your family. Um, they, are in, they are in large part in control of your long-term health and sustainability of your business. Um, so let those folks park in general parking, walk through the main gate, buy a ticket, use the bathrooms, sit in the grandstands, sit out there on a 95 degree day and bake when the, the announcer isn't saying anything um, and you don't have a clue what's going on. I grew up in round track racing. I'm a huge sprint car and super modified guy. And I was so, we went to a race a couple years ago at a neighboring racetrack and you could hear the supers in the distance. And I rolled down my window and my heart started pumping and I thought, oh man, this is gonna be great. Um, we got there, we sat in the stands, we heard nothing. The race was hours late and we didn't even stay. I stayed for the first lap, because that's the best lap. And, and uh, we got the heck out of there because it was midnight already. Um, think about every major stick and ball sport, three hours in duration, okay? If you're putting on a show, work within those narrow parameters. What Tommy just said, monster truck show, 90 minutes. Get them in, entertain the heck out of them, and get them out. These eight, 10, 12 hour funeral processions that John Grivens used to refer to a drag race as. Um, tight, don't be afraid to look within your three-hour window. Um, two final points. Um, guarantee. If you believe in what you're doing, why not put an unconditional money-back guarantee behind it? If, if, if you believe you're doing it right and you're doing it well, then um, guarantee it. If you come to XYZ, if you come to South Georgia Motorsports Park and you're dissatisfied, we'll refund your money. 
Wow. Um, that's what we do at Norwalk. We refund very little, if any, from year to year. But the point is your guest, we don't even call them customers anymore. We call them guests. Um, your guests need to know that you are receptive to hearing them when, when you have let them down somehow. Most of the time, our guests don't want anything. They just want us to know. So if you believe in it, guarantee it. And finally, um, to look at, we, we hired a guest advocate a couple of years ago, um, and it is her job to be a concierge. It's her job to advocate for the guest. So when we are putting on events and we're moving 30,000 people into our park, okay, we need to remember we're not herding cattle. These are people. So we have a guest advocate who advocates for the guest. And, she, and, and Yvonne has, um, at Summit Motorsports Park, introduced shuttles. We have a growing fan base. You talked about that, having a shuttle service, pregnancy parking, um, creature comfort features, amenities. Um, do we have family bathrooms? Do we have changing stations? I've never seen a changing station in a port john um, and God knows you don't want to slip with that one. Um, so the, the, the point is, <laughs> um, it's not so bad to have somebody looking at your facility through the eyes of the guest, because sometimes when we're doing our national events or our big events, we're looking big picture, and sometimes the guest gets lost in some of that. Um, is it important to diversify your facility uh, in regards to the events you hold, and can you guys give some examples of non-motorsport events that have been successful for you? Well, I think it's really important that we quit calling our facilities racetracks. You know, you look back 25, 30 years ago, they build these stadiums that have football games in them, and they'd, they'd use them eight or ten times a year, and that's all they used them for. And pretty soon, you know, if you've seen a concert come into a football stadium, that was a huge, huge deal because it's something that's never been done. Now you look at it, they use them for everything from concerts to RV shows to craft shows. They use them for everything they can use them for. There's no reason why we're not doing the same thing with our events. One of the things that I looked at, again, I, I try to look at everything through the customer's eyes. And when you look out there and you get to know your crowd, it's really fun. You walk out there and you know the same people that sit in the same seats every week. The problem is it's the same people every week. You've got this captive audience that's not growing. Okay, not everybody is a golf fan. You, you, I don't think you could pay me enough to get off the couch to go watch a golf match. Not everybody's a horse racing fan, and not everybody's a circle track racing fan. So you got to find something that they are. In my area up in the northwest, is a you know rugged logging farming community up there. We have a lot of truckers in that area. So I booked several years ago. I brought in the Rolling Thunder Big Rigs, which is your racing semi trucks, and we targeted. Every company that we could find, we sent out over 200 direct mailers to repair shops, tire shops, diesel shops, logging truck companies, hay hauling companies. If your company delivered propane, you got one of our flyers. Unbelievable, massive crowd, and most of them are first-time people. The biggest challenge you're going to have at your facility is teaching somebody how to drive in, get out, walk in, buy a ticket, and sit in the grandstands the first time. Once they've done it one time, it's easy to come back. Just like finding this room this morning for me. Walking around, once I found it, it's easy to come back here and do this again. The next thing we worked on, we got the, the, the diesel crowd, the truck crowd in there. We brought in a couple years later, we started doing monster truck shows because now we're attracting the kids, the families. And the other thing in my area, we have a lot of Hispanics because of all the, the agriculture and stuff. And they really, the Hispanics don't come out in my area for round track racing but they love monster trucks. We went to the point of even printing up, uh, doing the commercials, radio and TV in Spanish for them. And we packed the place with that. In my area also, there's a lot of farmers and stuff. So this year, the new venue we brought on is your truck and tractor pulls, and we marketed it strong to all the farms and all the farm stores and stuff like that. So I guess my point is, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Asphalt tracks, I think you can do more than dirt because with the weather and stuff, you can have a little bit of rain and still do flea markets and car shows and things like that. With dirt tracks, you can't do with the mud. But look at your facility, but look at what you have around you for a geographical population and build an event that's going to draw in a whole different genre of people and show them what your racetrack's really like, your facility. 
one of the last things we're, we're kind of working on also this year, because up in my area we have lots of mountains, snowmobiling's huge. This year we're going to come up with some kind of an event, whether it's just drag racing down the front stretch or whatever we can come up with, to do a specialty night and bring some snowmobiles in. Because that's going to bring in a whole other group of people, and if nothing else, the curiosity factor will get them in that are doing snowmobiles at Skagit Speedway. we we got to go see what that's all about. So come up with stuff that doesn't target the same fan base all the time. I mean, putting on late models and then going to midgets and going to sprint cars, that's still the same basic fan base. Come up with something completely different that draws in a whole new genre of people and expand the use of your facility. I agree 100% that I, I think that one of the common uh, you know pieces that we're saying here is that we have so much competition and the competition being the movies, the stick and ball sports, you know, things like that. So. We have to create those other things. I think the days of, you know, 30 years ago where somebody would come to a drag race every single Friday night or every single Saturday night, those are just limited because there's so many more things that they can do. So I think by us broadening out and having different um, genres for them to do, whether that's a monster truck event, uh, we have rugged maniac events, you know, completely different customer. And, and I think the benefit of that is they get to come in and see our facility and learn more about our facility and it might pique their interest of something else that we do that they didn't even know about, you know, especially, I think Rugged Maniac's a, uh, you know, it's an obstacle course deal that, that, that's a perfect example of somebody that would probably never come to the racetrack and see the racetrack, but didn't even know it was there, but they get introduced to our facility for a completely different reason. Um, so I think that it's really just a tool to, you know, you're, you're using other pieces to get people introduced to what we do um, and, and I think we have to be good. You know, I think the one thing that we can't do is we have to be good at each different piece that we do. You know, we can't just have multiple events and not be good at those just and focus on our drag racing or focus on our dirt, you know, side. Um, we have to be just as good at all of those events um, so that, you know, the experience is good and they want to come back. Because I think just as equally, if, you, if you're not good at it, they come and now there's a bad taste about everything at your event. You know, it's, uh, I'm not going back to Virginia Motorsports Park again. You know, so I think that's the key is uh, broadening, showing, um, you know, getting them in for different reasons, but also showing them that everything that happens at that facility is, you know, well done and well received. As I'm listening to those two, they're spot on with everything. And we talked about it before is the additional activities that you can do, whether it be the flea market, uh, the tough mutter, the runs, and, and there's so many things you can do out there. But as I'm listening to them, I think the one key to this is, and the, the plus about our industry is there's a lot of variety, whether it's a, a big city market, whether it's um, a dirt track or an asphalt round track, a drag strip. So you need to take all that into consideration of what works at your facility and in your market. And with that said, I think another key that will – resonate through this whole meeting today is that this is a business you know you have to figure out if you can afford that concert you have to figure out if you can afford the smaller local concert or the large concert you know you have to figure out if you can afford a uh, grave digger and feld or if you can afford a monster a regional monster truck so that's the next variation that i see a lot of promoters you know struggle with um but my message there is you just got to do a smart business decision have a business plan and even if you have to grow into it or, or anyway, take all these ideas and go back and see what fits with your facility and your business plan. If you have a 20 person staff or it's you and your wife, you know, that all these variables come into play. So you hear a lot of things that could get confusing, but if you always consider it, this is a business, you're trying to grow it and make it better and, and what fits our situation. I think there's a couple myths that we need to dispel. Number one, I think it's very easy for a small, what I'm going to call a small mom and pop track. Um, you know, in 1974, Summit Motorsports Park was Norwalk Dragway, and it was a mom and pop track. Um, we, we were in a city of 10,000. We were in a county of 50,000. Um, we had, within a 60-mile radius, uh, about 4.5 million people, very densely populated between Norwalk and Cleveland, very sparsely populated between Norwalk and Toledo. Um, I think it's very easy to look at Summit Motorsports Park today and say, well, gee, they have it easy. 
um, they have all the tools and all the assets. In 1974, Norwalk Dragway was a dump. Okay, it was it was. I, I remember going there, and and fence was falling over. It sat 800 people. Buildings were falling down. The pit area were the these giant pieces of rock. I, I mean, I'm not talking 57s. I'm talking about like this big. Um, and 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 my father, you know, attended school at Dayton University. He was pre-med. Didn't want to be a doctor. Dropped out. Was an iron worker. Uh, ran raced a super modified um, and bought this racetrack sight unseen, having never been to the track, having never seen a drag race. Um, but, he, but there were some principles that he understood as a racer, okay? These were things that bothered him. A promoter never did what they said they were going to do. A promoter never started on time. Um, and so there were things that, as a racer, when he bought a facility, he, he, he made sure that he would never make those same mistakes, okay? So I, I wanted to spell a myth that, well, gee, it's easy for Bill Bader Jr. to sit up there because he's Summit Motorsports Park and they have a staff and they have a market and they have all these things. Well, we didn't. We created that. And we created that by working hard, by under-promising and over-delivering, and just simply doing what we said we were going to do. So for all the tracks in here that think, well, gee, um, that's great, but we can't be that, you're wrong. You can be that, okay? But you, there's, some, there's some things that you need to do. Do a market analysis of your racetrack. Um, there is all kinds of software available to be able to look at, okay, how many people are actually here? I'll never forget Corky East. God bless him. Uh, Corky was a drag racer. Some of you may remember Corky East. And Corky had this vision for building a racetrack, and where did he build it? In Scribner, Nebraska. Population zip. It's not going to work. And, and here's a guy, sophisticated businessman, with a dream, and he built a racetrack with no population. Um, so I think uh, hopefully all of us have some population data. That, and, and a lot of people say, well, where is Norwalk, Ohio? Well, guess where Norwalk, Ohio is? Within a 300-mile radius, there's 49 million people. And that's with a big lake to the north of us. I, I managed a track uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania called Maple Grove. Within a 300-mile radius, they have 69 million people. So we have population that we don't even realize, and so we identify the population, and then... Within each one of our given markets, we look at what opportunities are available to us. And I think if we want to become a multi-use facility, I think one of the very first things we do is start to identify what those things are. I guess it's great. You know what? I want to be a multi-use facility. Great. What the hell does that mean? Well, that means that in addition to our core business, which is either round track or drag racing, we want to do different things at our racetrack. What kind of things do we want to do? Well, I'll tell you what. Here are some things. If you, Google is a wonderful thing. Start looking at obstacle courses, obstacle course runs. There are a half a dozen of them. Some of them require larger parcels of property. Some of them require smaller parcels of property. There's, a, there's one that I learned about that is female only. And they only require about two to 250 acres. The rugged maniacs um, and the tough mutters require 400 plus acres. We don't have that much land. I can't. I believe it or not, I can't. Ho I would love to host a tough mutter or a rugged maniac. I don't have enough ground, um, but I can do some of the smaller obstacle runs. Um, looking at doing uh, cross country runs at your facility, depending on where you're located. Um, looking at doing dog shows at your facility. Um, there are companies like Bendex who are constantly doing brake testing. We rent out our pit area to Bendex. We, in one year, we collected 50 or 60 grand in parking lot rent from Bendix while they were testing a new braking system. Um, there are all... We, my point is, some of what we can attract 
doesn't necessarily require marketing, promotion, or selling spectator tickets. It's just simply being opportunistic in your market. Um, start out by going to your local schools and see if you can be a host site for a mock disaster. Um, every year, the middle school comes to the racetrack and does an egg drop to test gravity. Um, and you have to clean up the eggs on the concrete. Drives me crazy, but it's okay. Um, so th my, my point is, not everything needs to involve 20 or 30 or 40,000 people. A Renaissance festival, a prairie peddler, a Yankee peddler, um, a city or community festival, okay? Um, a, a high school band competition, a battle of the bands. Um, there are all kinds of things that we can do with our facilities that are within the realm. South Georgia, how many acres do you have? Okay, do you do any type of obstacle course run? You do, uh, with who? Okay, um, and uh, so in how many runners are you getting? And I will tell you, you probably sell a ton of beer at that. I remember Brian Pierce telling me at Virginia years ago, his biggest beer event was his um, obstacle course run. Um, glow runs, um, 5Ks. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities, but we've got to think outside the box, and we've got to get out of this mindset that we're a racetrack. Drag racing is boring. It is boring. I would much rather go see a sprint car race than watch a drag race, okay? Um, but the point is, one of the things that I feel that is a great tool for me is that I, I'm not entertained by tradition. Now, I'm not a... He, he, I'm not the dog and pony show guy. Well, maybe I am. The guy that you hate, maybe, a little bit. But, but the point is, it puts 40,000 people in our racetrack for a single night. Um, and, and so look at things that you can do, packaging an entertainment show that involves pre-race parades, autograph session, outros, um, where you have an opportunity to, inter maybe you put, this is a page out of a monster truck show, put all the stars on the track and invite the fans out onto the track. Here's something we forget. Um, if I ever got a chance to be invited out onto the field at Notre Dame or at Green Bay, I mean, those are hollowed grounds that very few people ever get to step on. A lot of people think of our facilities that same way. Okay, I remember going down Vince Lombardi Way, and literally, I par the first time I ever laid eyes on Green Bay Stadium, I parked the truck and I stepped out of my car, and I'm looking at this thing, and it's like it's got a ring, or it's fantastic. And Jamie said, "Get back in the truck." And but but it's it was like the mecca, you know. And a lot of people look at our facilities that way, and yet we don't look at our facilities that way. So if we don't look at them that way, how do we expect our guests to? Um, so there are tons, and I'll tell you what, anybody in this room, um, I've got uh, business cards. I would be more than happy to help anyone. Um, but you can Google, and there are tons of opportunities you'd be shocked at. Um, driving schools. We, we work with a company called Driving Dynamics. Um, they pay us twelve or $1,300 every day to use our parking lot. We do nothing. We gave them a key. Let yourself in, lock up. Um, do eight or 10 or 12 of those. Um, lots of opportunities to do different things. Uh, highway patrol, uh, defensive driving classes. Um, there's all kinds of things we can do with our facility if we open our eyes and are receptive to them. Kristen? I just want to add one last thing. We've talked about a lot of multi-use stuff up here, but I just want to caution you also that if you're not doing a bunch of that stuff, don't try to take on too much right off the bat. You know, pick something and focus on it and really build it. You know, an idea is not a plan. It's great to say, yeah, I want to do a monster truck show and in your mind you see all these people in the grandstands having fun, but that's step one, that's step 10. Step two through nine, that's a tough one. So just don't try to get too big too fast, control growth. I went into the concert promoting business one year because I thought I was doing really good. And make a long story short, I bought too big of bands, I spent too much money and lost about 72,000 bucks in one day. So that was the best business lesson I've ever had in my life. 
the most humbling one I've ever had. So expand what you're doing, but just do one thing at a time and make it really solid and get it off the ground working before you start adding a second and third special event to it. And to build on that, um, you can sometimes find an industry professional that within that discipline is an expert that sometimes if they're creditable um, and you do your due diligence, you partner with and you bring their expertise um, because we are not all experts at everything. Um, as an example, I put on an event called Armageddon, the Eve of Destruction, and it was. I lost 100 grand in a single night. It was the Eve of Destruction, and it was, dev it was devastating. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, but it was a thrill show, and I had a guy shoot himself out of a cannon, and I had the famous Walindas walking a tightrope and all of this stuff, and it was a complete mess. So the point is there are experts that you can go to um, that you can partner with or lease your facility to um, that, that uh, may make sense. And additionally, pick something that's a manageable target. Maybe the goal is in 2019 that we want to have one of something or two of something. Um, don't, yeah, don't go after 50 things. Controlled growth um, is the best growth. And if you are going to partner with somebody, I did. I partnered with some people on my concert because they told me they knew what they're doing. They'd done this before. The mistake I made was I didn't check their references. And when I got done, the amount of money they spent on advertising and where they spent it, looking back on that, I, I should have just walked over and thrown it off a bridge. So I agree. If you don't know what you're doing, partner with somebody, get an expert in there, but do your due diligence on them to make sure they know what they're doing too because a lot of people think they do, but they don't. Uh, what are your thoughts and approach to uh, to working with the local media and getting the surrounding community involved with your facility? So another thing that I was thinking is is myself, and I think it's industry-wide really right now, we're in a great time as Bill started. We're really bullish also, but I I have told people here lately, I feel like I'm a little old school. So there's nothing wrong, I think, with being old school and then also embracing the new technology and what have you. But back to the old school, I still like to take the newspaper guy to lunch. I still like to pick the phone up and talk to the new local newscaster and make him feel that, A, we have a personal relationship. B, he's more than welcome to call us and ask questions. You know, if he doesn't know what we're doing or why we're honoring this champion or why this car flipped over, then he's probably not going to write about it or talk about it because he's not going to put himself in a position to not be knowledgeable to his readers, listeners. So I still really um, take a lot of uh, effort to build some relationships. And this is at our weekly track that we've done that's been there for 70-some years. So the local media we have a very, very close relationship with. Now that I'm doing more and more, we'll go into a market, even if it's Minneapolis, I'll still try to do the same thing. And it's really paid off for me. I'll literally pick the phone up and talk to the local sports person where the majority of people think they're untouchable. And I, I've found that very few of them are untouchable. If you treat them just like a normal person and talk to them and, and build that relationship and respect, but always remember they have a job to do. They have a, 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 a tight schedule that they're going to be putting this content in that it really works well. I think the media um, is a very important part. One of the challenges a lot of us have is the depth of staff to be able to um, routinely uh, manage, relationship build, feed a media um, outlet. So we have the good fortune of having a full-time PR person, but we haven't always had that person. It was. Um, we finally got to the point where we needed to have that full-time person help control the narrative, um, be able to tell our side, be able to market what we're doing. So my recommendation would be, um, and I've done this and I've been successful at it, look in your pit area, okay? If you don't have the depth of staff or you don't have the financial wherewithal to necessarily put a person on payroll, um, here are some tricks. You can, I guarantee you that there is somewhere in your pit area somebody that has a communications background, somebody that's a writer, somebody that you can give a season pass to, um, and they can start to crank out some content for you. Um, they can help 
feed your website. They can help feed Facebook. They can help interact with your local media. Um, I think what, you, what we all have time to do, even though we don't, um, is to take your local sports writer um, to lunch, to be able to talk to them, to be able to introduce your product, to be able to um, uh, introduce them into why this venue um, is so critical. You know, something that we don't, we don't have on the agenda, but economic impact. We all generate economic impact. Um, there's nothing wrong with, take, with, with facilitating an economic impact study. Um, they are now relatively inexpensive. If you have a neighboring school, whether it's a junior college, whether it's a, a state school, to be able to go to the business office and say, hey, I'd like a project. I'd like to ask your students to do a project and facilitate an economic impact study. Um, to have an economic impact study, because um, we deal, how many, you know, we deal with noise, right? And we deal with traffic, and we deal with, in my case, I deal with an airport. Um, we all have government agencies, we all have activist groups, we all have neighbors who, by the way, everybody within a certain radius of your racetrack who's a neighbor ought to have a season pass. They deal with traffic, they deal with noise, they deal with um, people throwing debris in their front yards. Um, give them a season pass. Send them a pass um, and, and tell them that you appreciate them. Um, make sure you clean up their yards first after a big event. Um, just simple, basic, neighborly stuff. Not rocket science here, just take care of your neighbors. But um, I, think to, I think your media partnerships and your media relationships can be invaluable, especially when you're faced with challenges, when you're faced with an EPA or a noise ordinance or a, a potential amusement tax or a potential um, curfew. Um, you, if you have that rapport with those newspapers, um, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt rather than crucifying you. Um, so uh, to, to uh, another option is to newspaper people are very poorly paid. Okay, So by the way, that sports writer may be somebody you could hire part-time to work at your racetrack. Um, to find a beat reporter or to find a, a journalist or to find somebody, they starve. They're paid nothing. Um, so if you can't afford somebody full-time, look to your local newspaper. Um, I've had success. We did that for years at Summit Motorsports Park, um, and, uh, and that worked really well for us. And, and again, it's all the same content. That, that content that goes in the newspaper can be modified for the website, can be used in social. Um, if you're not email blasting, um, to start to collect data, um, and that's something that I guess is a different topic here, but data collection so you can direct market to your customers is a big deal. Um, so there are a number of ways of skinning that cat um, if you want to start to have a, um, a media presence at your racetrack. I, uh, I think the local media and marketing groups are really important from the, uh, and this word was said a couple times, is the relationships. You know, they have a ton of relationships within the community, and, uh, you know, I think we want them to be our friends. We want them to uh, have our back, so to speak, you know, just so that, uh, you know, they're, they're promoting us, they're getting us in contact with other people. I know we're at Virginia Motorsports Park. At, we're in a really small uh, town called Dinwiddie, and, uh, you know, since I've been in there, just they're my best friends right now. You know, we're trying to keep it that way. We have a neighboring uh, housing development that came after the racetrack, of course. You know, and everybody hears these stories and they're complain. You know, they complain about noise and things like that. But one of the first things I that I did when I got the racetrack was reach out to them, bring them in, just ask them what what can I do to help you? What are the things that we don't? Uh, what are the things that we do or that have done in the past that you don't like? Um, and just tried to listen to what they have. So again, I think it's all about the relationships and you know, if, if the local newspaper guy likes you, the guy he likes, he's gonna tell him that he likes you, you know, and just kind of build that community all in one. Um, being in a small county like we are, you know, it's, uh, it, it helps to have everybody on the same page and not, not to be the enemy of it. So uh, 
I, I think it's all, you know, the biggest gain there is the relationship. You know, these guys have got a lot of good points and uh, as far as dealing with the media. And the one thing, like Bill was saying, that these guys are underpaid. The other thing is they're extremely overworked because the budget cutbacks where they used to have two or three people covering the beat, they got one or two covering it now. And sometimes it's a burden on them because they get sent to your racetrack to cover an event. And it's almost a burden because they'd rather be doing something else and just tired. So you really got to take care of these people. Um, one of the biggest things that, that uh, we've worked with in our area is we constantly send them information. You know, we almost try to do their job for them. You know, we flood right down to the TV stations. We get a hold of the sports people, the TV station, and, and develop a relationship. The radio stations, all of them, the newspapers. Because remember, we talked about the different age groups. You know, I'm almost 60 years old. I still enjoy reading the newspaper. I got some of my good friends that are in their late 30s that have never read a newspaper. But don't ever overlook everything from the newspaper all the way down to the social media stuff. But we send stuff out constantly to newspapers, to radio stations, to TV stations, all that stuff. And every now and then they'll hit on something, that, you know, upcoming events. We don't just cover what's happened. We start sending stuff out. You know, hey, we got, you know, monster trucks coming. We got our annual cancer walk coming, things like that. Human interest stories, everything, because they're constantly looking for content to be able to fill. And they may not always have room to fill with what you've got, but... You'd be surprised how many times they'll they'll hit on something and call you and say, hey, what's going on with this? And they want to do a little piece on it. And a lot of times they'll do a little story about something upcoming, which that's free advertising. So really embrace your your uh, your media members. And, and it doesn't hurt to take them to lunch once in a while. It doesn't hurt to cater to them at the racetrack. And, you know, just be their friend because really they're doing you a favor. I mean, they're, they're doing something for you that's, you know, a lot of people don't want to do. Steve just hit on something that's golden do their work for them. They are underworked, they are underpaid, or, or overworked and underpaid, and I can't tell you how many times, if you, in the old days, you used to send them a little snippet or you would call and say, hey, we got something cooking. Now, they'll say, hey, can you send me a press release on that? Or can you send me the story on that? Can you send me a pic? Um, and um, if you can do that, you, you, the probability of coverage is going to go up because they are they are spread way thin. So if you can help them by doing some of that stuff, um, that'll go a long way. Secondly, don't reach out to them one time a year. Cardinal sin. Um, okay, so you've got a national event or you've got a big independent show, and we're going to reach out because we need media support. So every May, they get a call from you. Bad, bad, bad because it, clearly you're just using them for your benefit. Um, you want to develop a rapport, a relationship, so you have that with them in good times and in bad. Um, so don't neglect them. Reach out to them, drop them a note, send them a text message, send them a Christmas card, take them to lunch, um, have an event where you don't want them to come out and work, but you want to just invite them and their family out as your guest for an evening of entertainment. You know, we beat on our media pretty hard at our national event. So at our Night Under Fire, when it's more of an entertainment package, we invite media and their family and their family to come out as our guest. And we cater a meal, and it's our way of saying thank you. Um, so don't relationship build, don't use. Something that's real easy, too, to do is when you got your media up there, always have snacks for them. Have bottles of water, something this simple. It costs you nothing to do. Chips, cookies, snacks. You just make sure you say, hey, there's some stuff over there. You guys help yourself. We want you to have it. One other thing is some just basic stuff, real simple basic stuff. Give them a handwritten thank you note once in a while. Send it to the sports department. Throw in a dozen tickets and just say, here's some tickets for your staff. We appreciate all you do for us. You'd be surprised how far that goes with radio stations, newspapers, you know, even the TV stations, but they get swag like that, and it just shows that you really care about them more than just what they can do for you. One quick thing on on them, you doing their work for them. That's great, and it's very true, and that will get you uh, in good graces with them, but here's what will destroy that. And, and I'm kind of a pet peeve at this, but it still goes to the professionalism that we should all present, but with them especially, one misspelled word, one um, grammar mistake because 
they view that, and if they are going to copy and paste or they don't have time to fix your work, you need to be very cautious of that. One time, maybe they'll say it's a mistake. Two, three times, the rest of your pressures will go in the garbage because they can't trust it, and they have to answer their bosses, their readers. They cannot take the gamble of putting something in that paper with uh, any kind of mistake like that. So I think it's very important to them, and it just I just want to bring that up because – that will ruin your relationship with them very quickly um, is getting them something with, that they cannot reproduce and, and, and look at that as their work because their boss or their readers don't know that they didn't write that. <laughs> so they cannot take that gamble of having something go in the paper not professional. Uh, could we touch a little on social media and how important is that and uh, what platforms seem to work best for you guys? Well, again, old school to new school, we use about every platform. I try to hit on everything, and my people that work for me just hate that because I have young work for me, and an old, or I'm older, and, and whether it's the newspaper, the TV station, the radio, I mean, I literally have – uh, a worker for me that says nobody looks at websites anymore, that they're outdated. It's just, it's it's an endless, so we, well, I try to hit the whole shotgun approach, and in social media, I'm finding that the word social media seems to be very loosely used now, because, you know, it can be anything from websites to Google to, which is next door, to Facebook, to email blasts, um, and, and, and Instagram, and, and I'm naming 10, and there's probably 100. So, I think that's my main focus, is we do use them all, and it really began a few years ago when we realized um, that it was free. You know, you can reach all these people for free. That's evolved a little bit now. You know, there's some expense. There's uh, You can buy some of it. You can hire people to geo-target, you know, all the way down to if they've been to your racetrack before or they bought went to an auto parts store, would they be a race fan? Did they go to a monster truck event before? So some of that costs money now, a little bit more than it did when we first started the social media craze. But it's still very valuable and still much more inexpensive than buying a, a, a television commercial during the Daytona 500. So, again, I guess in the short version of the social media, it's very important, if not critical, to what we do to, to reach different people. And um, as I said before, it's not Disney, it's not NFL, it's not department stores or restaurants. Everyone's using it now, and there are many, many different ways, and I suggest you – Talk to one of us, get on Google and find out how it all works, but there's a lot, a lot to social media. Uh, social media piece of it I think is important. I, I think we kind of take an approach of using all of them because there's so many different um, age groups that we can reach. You know, Facebook seems to be the one that uh, can, you know, access a lot more people, but with that said, Instagram's a lot more of your younger crowd. Haven't had a lot of, you know, it's, it's hard to do that on Snapchat and, and Twitter. Um, but I think the, the hard part about social media is uh, who you're accessing. It's one thing to access all your friends and the people that already know what's going on. But it's also, you know, you have to be pretty creative to get it out to new people and get, get your things shared and target other audiences. Um, but I definitely think that... Um, it's a big piece and it can be a big piece. And, you know, we've seen the shift from, you know, conventional TV and radio into social media. Um, the cost factor is definitely huge. It's a lot less than what you would spend in TV and radio. So the, uh, you know, the risk is not there. Um, you know, I think that the nice piece with social media is you can constantly do that. You're not just putting an ad in a paper or a TV uh, commercial that's, going to run for two weeks or, or whatever that is. So you get a longer time to build. Um, so I definitely think it's a very valuable piece that we can all use. Um, you know, most everyone's on it and we've seen a shift, you know, I mean, everybody has their cell phone on them. So why not reach them at all times and try to get that information to them? You know, as far as the social media stuff, I'm, I don't do it. I mean, I don't personally do it, but I've hired probably the best person I could find and I really encourage you to find somebody that knows what they're doing and, and research it. You know, I, I think it's important to be everywhere. A little bit everywhere is better than a whole bunch in just a few places because it's still, like Bob said, it's kind of the shotgun effect. you got to have a little bit of presence everywhere, even right down to your newspaper ads. You know, on a weekly show, 
you're not going to get any more people in the grandstands if you run a half-page ad versus an eighth-page ad. But when it comes to special events, if it's going to be big, you got to make it look big. Putting an eighth-page ad in there for your summer nationals or something is probably going to diminish it. That's where you need to step up a little bit on that because then it becomes something special. But as far as the social media stuff, there's there's so much stuff out there right now that, you know, it's a it's an ever-changing cycle. But you got to be a little bit everywhere and, and focus on it. Everything from the Google keywords to the Facebook pushes, the geofencing works, uh, constant contact. You just you got to be a little bit everywhere on that. Find somebody that knows how to do it, that, that really knows how to do it, not just somebody that thinks they know how to do it. And it's going to make a big difference. You know, it was funny. We were having this conversation 20 years ago that there was a cookie cutter method to taking an event to market. At Norwalk Raceway Park, we would buy the number one Cleveland station, WMMS, the number one Toledo station, WIOT, 26 or 28 spot, backloaded, week of buy, period. 60-second commercials. That was it. And that's how you took an event to market 20 or 30 years ago. I just sat down and scratched out. We have become multi-channel marketers. We have website. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have Instagram. We have television. We have radio. We have Pandora, Sirius XM. We have digital. We have print and display. We have outdoor. We have third party. We have email. We have mommy blogs. We have direct mail. Okay, 14, and I didn't even capture them all. We have 14 ways, um, and I think social media um, is, is, I'm not sure, th there's a difference between digital marketing and social media. Social media is putting stuff on Facebook, putting stuff on Twitter, putting stuff on Instagram, putting stuff on, um, w w there are other, there are other social medias that I'm not even thinking of right now because I'm not a social media guy. Um, however, you, you, with it, it's funny, you made a comment about website. Well, a website, there may become a day in our lifetime where websites become obsolete. Why? Because um, everybody thought Facebook was going to be the new website. Well, Facebook skews older. We already have graying fan bases. I think we all do. So now we're looking to Instagram. Well, we skipped over Twitter, and, and a year from now, there's going to be some other thing. And so I don't know that we get married necessarily. You can't marry one medium anymore. You have to date them all. 30 years ago, we were married to radio. Today, we date 15 to 20 different platforms, and we call ourselves multi-channel marketers. Um, so... Just to clarify, social media is throwing stuff, something up on Facebook. Um, you can measure it by likes. You can measure it by shares. I don't know. To this day, I don't know how that translates to putting people through the turnstiles and selling tickets. Now, you can use digital marketing. Digital marketing is where you actually have a spend. They take your database. Okay, hopefully we all have a database. They take your database, they run it through a number of algorithms and analytics, and they create a three-dimensional walking, talking, breathing model of your customer, and then they go out and they find more. And they will use banner ads, and they will use click-throughs, and they will plant um, uh, pixels. And so let's say you're selling tickets to a race, you see an ad on Facebook that you paid for. You click on it, and it takes you to a landing page where you read about the event. So now they've been able to track because there's a pixel that is a tracking device. And then if you say, gee, this is interesting, you click on the buy tickets. Um, and then you see what the tickets cost, and you either... And keep in mind, once you've clicked on that banner ad... Um, they are following you. So now, through a digital marketing campaign, they can tell you how many click-throughs, how many landing pages, how many people abandoned the transaction in the shopping cart, how many people bought. And they can tell you that for a $10,000 spend, you sold $30,000 in tickets, $50,000 in tickets. So it's a 3-to-1, 5-to-1. On average, it's about a 7-to-1 return, at least on the stuff that I've seen. So that's digital marketing. Um, social, 
again, is just being active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and whatever else the latest, greatest thing is or will be a year from now. But we can't be married to one platform. We need to be multi-channel marketers. One real quick thing about this whole conversation. 20 years ago, old school, we were all talking about the flat build hat, the new customer, the new customer. One thing I want to remind everybody, don't forget about your, your customer now. We've Sometimes that can happen. Um, some of our dirt events, Eldora, everybody's heard of Eldora, the Dome in St. Louis just happened. I went to the Snowball Derby in Pensacola. You look around, a lot of those are not new fans. I'm, I'm telling you, they are diehard Scott Bloomquist fans, Donnie Schatz fans. They know the world of outlaws. They knew where they were going. They know Pensacola, the Snowball Derby. They know Bubba Pollard. I, I don't forget about your customers that you, we already have. There's a lot of them. So not, not to throw so many items at you, but we didn't even talk about that yet. And I, it's, I believe that's a key that I'm, I'm already full circle focusing back on Eldora's 20,000 people. I mean, you know, some of my facilities we don't need 100,000 people like an ass car race. So – we really have a core group of customers right now. So we're very fortunate with that. So don't forget those people. The core is king. Core is king. Uh, so the, the sportsman racers make up the majority of, of the industry. So how can we build a stronger uh, sportsman racer base? You know, it's interesting. Um, I think we all have a tendency to overlook our sportsman program. And at Summit Motorsports Park, what built a, cor a, 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 I would call it a foundationary block, a cornerstone, what built our success was our affinity, our passion, our love of the sportsman racer. Um, you need a strong weekly program. It is very difficult, and I would challenge facilities, and there are some big ones, that are owned by Bruton Smith, where they run just big events at their racetrack. They don't run weekly programs because they're a nuisance. They're, well, I guess my feeling is w your weekly program is filled with families, filled with your core, core is king, and those are ambassadors for your racetrack. Those are, I can't tell you how many times I've had core customers, racers, reach out to me and say, hey, I think there's a sponsor opportunity with a person I ran across. Or a core customer, a racer, will call you and say, hey, I want to do a company day and I want to buy 200 tickets to a race. Or I want to um, celebrate a birthday or an anniversary or, or whatever. Those are ambassadors. Those are goodwill ambassadors that are out in the market in your area, your ADI, your area of dominant influence, um, supporting you marketing you, talking you up, saying to people, hey, I'm going to be at South Georgia or I'm going to be at Summit Motorsports Park this weekend. Come and see me race. Um, you cannot devalue or underestimate the importance of your sportsman program. I think one of the challenges are, um, I know in the South, lots of bloodshed in the South over sportsman racers. Everybody, giant entry fees. And, and giant purses. I just lived that um, my year at Maple Grove in the Northeast in the King of, I mean, a $2,000 to win or $3,000 to win isn't a big deal. It's an every weekly occurrence in the Northeast. So too are $75 entry fees um, with buybacks and sharing of cars and multiple this and holy cow, what a hot mess. So I lived this this year. This isn't theory or this is reality. So I went to Maple Grove this year. I right-sized the entry fee. I guaranteed the purse. The entry fee went from $75 to $40 car and driver, okay? Guaranteed the purse. Um, promised them a fair entry fee, a guaranteed purse, a hook and racetrack, a reliable timing system, and friendly people. And we went from 200 car average last year to seeing a high water mark of 418 this year. That's a fact, okay? Um, what did that? What, all we did, th these were basic human conventions. We charged them an affordable amount to race. We promised them a reliable timing system, a hooking racetrack, and friendly staff. 
We're not going to beat you up in tech. We're not going to run black letter NHRA law. I don't believe in it. Hope nobody's here that are you wearing an NHRA shirt. Are you with NHRA? Oh, <laughs> that's right. I forgot about Casey. Casey, disregard that. Um, the reality of it is, listen, we have a racer who, who comes to the track. He has spent five years on this car, okay? He comes to the track, and the thing's not even in gel coat. It's rusty, and it's primered, and it looks like a hot mess. So they come to tech. What are we going to say to them? Dude, you're not going to run this bucket of bolts today, are you? You just insulted his child, so it is our job to figure out how to make that car legal to race as opposed to putting a notch in our tech belt and saying, get it out of here. Um, I, I, again, that gets back to guest service. You've got to be guest friendly in tech too. Um, so I think to look at our programs and don't look at where they're at today. I think it's very easy to be in the Northeast or to be in the South and say, my God, I, I, I'm going to get killed if I cut entry fees in half and guarantee purses and do all that stuff. I did it. I lived it, and it was hugely successful to the point where owners were complaining about why we were running so late and what was all the congestion and why were the lights on and what was all the noise. Um, I'm telling you, big car counts on a weekly basis will translate at your big events like your big money race, your, whether it's a box race, a no-box race, whether it's an entertainment show like Night Under Fire, whether it's a, a touring event like, um, trust me, Pro Media, NMCA, NMRA, they would rather come to a facility with a strong racer base than a facility with no racer base because some of those 400 cars that are coming to Maple Grove will come back to the NMRA event that's there in June in 2019. So um, you've got it. It gets back to core is king. Your weekly racer is your core customer. They're your best advocate, um, and you've got to take care of them. And there are simple ways to grow your pit area. You know, to, high, to have a really strong upper-level racing divisions, you've got to have a really strong medium-level racing division. But the only way you're going to have that is if you've got a really good entry level. And that's where we get back to the sportsman-style racing. Two-thirds of the people in your grandstands wish they were racers. They're all armchair racers up there. And... Donnie Schatz didn't start at the World Outlaws. You know, Steve Kinzer didn't. I mean, go down the list, anybody that's successful. Casey Kane from my area, he didn't start in sprint cars. He started in mini sprints. You got to have, it's almost like baseball. You got to have that farm league. You know, up in my area, I'm very fortunate because right off turn three and four, I've got a quarter midget track. We get them started at five, six years old, very inexpensive cars. From there, they graduate and go up the road 20 miles. We've got a really good uh, mini sprint track up there. I got kids coming back to my track at 14 and 15 years old that's got eight years driving experience. So it's already bred into them and stuff. But I think it's really key at every racetrack, you've got to have that one class that's very inexpensive and easy for them to get started in. Because once you get them in, you get them started, they can grow from there. It's almost like the orchard theory. You plant the tree, you grow it pretty soon, it bears fruit. But you got to give them that growing time. And you got to have a strong, stable class and it's got a, the biggest thing is this guy that comes out there and is, whether it's a bomber stock or a sportsman sprint car, you got to make them feel just as important as the headliner show because in their eyes, that's everything they've got. When I had my parts store, the guy that spent a thousand bucks a year to me was just as important as the guy that spent 20,000 because to him, a thousand bucks was as big as 20,000 is the big guy. Same thing with your race cars, your entry level classes, your sportsman classes, that's everything they've got. Because if they had the money, they'd have moved up by now. So in their world, that's everything they've got. You gotta make them feel like that's the most important class that's out there because at the end of the day, it is. And most of the guys in your sportsman level classes, if you do a geographical circle around your racetrack, say go out 15 miles, count how many car owners live within 15 or 20 miles, you'll find out the more of your sportsman entry level drivers live the closest to the racetracks. And they're bringing their families, they're bringing their friends, their co-workers, they're bringing their neighbors. Those people are going to probably put more people in your grandstands that they're dragging with them. Granted, the hardcore fans might be coming to watch the upper-level classes, but your entry-level classes are going to drag a lot more people because they want them to know that they're a professional racer and that they're on their way. 
So really, I can't emphasize enough to have a really strong entry-level class, sportsman-level class, because that's tomorrow's upper-level class racers. I think Steve's right. You have to you have to respect those just as much as you respect the world of outlaws. I mean, they are, you know, they, they put their pants on just like we talked earlier, like anybody else, and that they think that's the biggest thing in the world that they're telling their family and their coworkers where they're going to, the, to your facility to race. A quick story, uh, this is even a little bit below what we call a sportsman. It's more of a uh, even a hobby than a racing, but we do four cylinders. And when we first started, we literally had 70 cars showing up you know, just having fun. We'd split them up into five, six feature events. But my pit gate guy one time, I'll, this is one of my better stories. Here come two guys in a, in a pickup truck with a U-Haul trailer pulling a car, drove right by our pit gate. They had no idea they were supposed to stop and get a pit pass. <laughs> that was my favorite customer of ever. I mean, brand new to the sport, didn't even know what they were supposed to be doing. So don't shy away from those people, that, that certain group that wants to learn and wants to become part of the racing industry and the family. Treat them just as good as you treat Donnie Schatz. I, I agree again. Um, I think that it's our job as racetracks to help build that racer base. You know, we're, we're trying to feed a racer base and uh, we want the, the stars of the show to come out and, and have our bigger events, but we also have to help get there. You know, we can't focus just on that side of it and leave it up to someone else. So I think it's kind of our responsibility to uh, create that. And, and I think it's our responsibility as well to give, you know, the, the test and tune nights, uh, let it be their night. You know, that, that's your amateur night, so to speak, that comes in and, and the racetrack's theirs. It's not taken over by someone else that is running a class or something else. And, you know, a lot of these people are just trying to, they have the interest, they're there, they come in with their car, and we need to give them their time to be able to enjoy um, you know, and this is from a drag racing pr perspective, you know, but uh, a younger kid comes in with his car and wants to make a hit on the racetrack and do that um, and just have fun. You know, I think that's what they want. They want the fun. They don't necessarily want the structure and having to run a class and compete because they don't feel like they're ready. So, you know, I think that that piece of it is huge. You know, the, the test and tunes become your bracket racer. Your bracket racer becomes your, you know, higher level of sportsman racer and from there into a pro racer. So. I think we're building that, and that's important for us. The other piece to that, you know, talking about uh, that sportsman racer base, there's nothing better, I think, than them going out in the community and talking about my racetrack, you know, going out and saying, you know, that Virginia Motorsports Park, that's my racetrack. And, and I think that's huge. You know, I grew up going to the racetrack every Friday, Saturday night, and it was – that, that was my racetrack. I got to do that. And, you know, I, I think it's huge to be able to do that. And they're just, it's just free advertisement. It's just everything that they get to tell their friends. They, that's how we build our brand, so to speak. And, and I think that's what's, that's all we're trying to do here is build our brand the whole way through and, and facilitate getting people back into our facility. So I think all of it's huge from the first person that drives in, you know, for the first time to the, the pro racer. Once you start building your sportsman level two, the one thing that's extremely important is that you keep a thumb on it, you keep the costs under control. Because I'll tell you right now, the people with the most money will have the loudest voices every year. And they're gonna always be chirping in your ear. You ought to let us start running this, it's gonna make the cars better, safer. And everything they wanna suggest is gonna cost everybody money. They can afford it, but can everybody else afford it? And the last thing you wanna do is just start escalating the cost of the car to where you used to be able to run this car for you know, you could build a car for a couple thousand bucks and go out and run it. Now it's costing you six or eight thousand. So keep a class. You know, we have the four cylinder imports and we got rules on it to where you can build them cars for, you know, eleven, twelve hundred bucks with all your safety gear in it. So keep a class like that. But your lower levels, just really watch the rules and keep it affordable. And don't let the people with the money and the loud voices convince you to start changing stuff because at the end of the day they're the ones that's going to move up and leave everybody else holding the bag with an expensive race car you know to that point he is spot on uh, you look at our uh, our weekly class it's super pro or an IHRA it's top um, this is a uh, a 7 to 11.99 time break class and I, I've got probably 50% of our class bracket racing 710 to 720 at 180 miles an hour 
and they want to lower the time break, and they want all of these ad advantages, and you can't pay them enough because you're only paying uh, 1100 to win or 1500 to win or whatever you're paying. But keep something in mind. You didn't tell them to travel around the country in a half a million dollar rig. You didn't tell them that they needed to bracket race at 185 miles an hour every week. And invariably, those are the first people that are going to leave your pit area to travel, to go to big money races. Um, don't cater to the elite. Cater to the people who want to be in your pits, who, who want to hang out afterwards, cook out, drink a beer, bench race. Those are the people that are going to be loyal to you week in and week out. Those elite, those elitist sportsman racers, um, they're going to want to go out and, and travel a series and go to big money stuff. And, and uh, those are temporary guests. You want, to, you want to cater to the people that are with you every week. So uh, what is your approach to sponsorship? Um, I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, we were talking, Bob and I were talking before the meeting started. Um, we went through a period in 06, 07, 08 where the phone rang and, man, we couldn't collect dollars quick enough. Um, and then October of 09 hit and there was an exodus. And this, But um, there was something I learned in the Great Recession of um, October of 2009 and that was there were also sponsors leaving stick and ball sports that were looking for value-oriented sponsorship. So as there was an exodus of some partners leaving, um, companies like um, Great Wolf Lodge, that was a, a group that was spending money in the NFL that decided to spend 25 grand a year with us as an official partner. Uh, Kelly Services left in NASCAR. Um, they wanted to spend some money in drag racing, and we converted that into a nice six-figure sponsorship. Um, so I, I think we're, it's it. So we were doing well, and then we kind of saw a a lull, and now we're starting to see the la this year and last year, um, we're starting to see corporate America that wants to spend dollars again. They want to spend dollars, but there's a difference. They don't want in 07, K and N spent 40 grand and all they wanted was signage, okay? I mean, literally, I had a conversation with KNN. They said, we want to spend 40 grand at your racetrack. We want signage. That's it. Well, let me tell you something. That's about as easy as it gets. That's over. There is not a corporate partner worth their salt that is being fiscally responsible that now wants to just throw money into signage at your racetrack anymore. It's all about activation. It's all about conversion. It's all about eyeballs. It's all about... So, um, the, 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 the rules have changed. However, um, companies have money. They're spending money. I think as long as we continue to have prosperous times like we've had the last two years for the, for the next two and for the next four-year term of, of, of Trumponomics, I don't want to get into politics, but the point is the economy is strong and getting stronger. Um, I think there's opportunity. And I don't think we all need to be looking for Fortune 50, 50 companies to be spending money. Um, I think that there are sponsors. We have as many $1,000 signage sponsors as we do um, big. Actually, we have more of them. It's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your sponsor dollars comes from 20%. Um, but you lose one of those majors, those 20 percenters, and it hurts. It hurts a bunch. So um, I think to go out and find those mom-and-pop businesses, go out and find a deal with a car. I mean, there are I, – I put together last year, um, I had a couple people actually reach out to me that asked for sponsor proposals, and I sent generic proposals. I also sent a worksheet. Um, for those of us who aren't maximizing our sponsorship – we need to build an inventory in an Excel spreadsheet. Here's how many signage spots we have. Here's how many events we have. Here's how many display opportunities we have. Create an inventory of availability. It's very easy to sit in your office and say, I can't sell sponsorship. Well, what's the inventory? Well, I've got all kinds of inventory. Well, what? What do you have? I have 27 8 by 
20 or 8 by 10 or, I'm sorry, 3 by 8 or 3 by 20 sign locations. I have X amount of square footage of in-focus TV. I have grandstand. I have back of grandstand. Sit down and create an inventory of what you have. Associate a value to each one of those um, pieces of inventory. We sell a 3 by 8 at Summit Motorsports Park for 1000 bucks. It's It's low. But there are lots of people that just want to be a part of what you're doing that are willing to spend $1,000 to be part of their racetrack. I loved what Tommy said. That's my track. Virginia Motorsports Park, my home track. If you're doing your job, you have thousands of people that are fully vested and have ownership interest in your racetrack. If nobody says my track, you've got a problem. Um, so... I, I think it starts with an inventory. I think it starts with a philosophy of what you're going to charge for those pieces. And then we're not looking for home runs here. We're looking for singles and doubles and triples. And, that, and then you grow that. Reach out to your racers. Reach out to your uh, team members. Network with everybody you have because there are spots. I guarantee you there is ten to twenty thousand dollars a year right under your nose that's low hanging fruit that you don't even know is there. I mean I did it. I did it this summer at Maple Grove. Okay. Um, talk to your sponsors. Find out what they're happy about. Find out what they're unhappy about. Um, you may have a square peg in a round hole and you may have a partner that doesn't know we have to outthink because sometimes our corporate partners don't know what they want. It's our job to educate them. It's our job to sell. We're not order takers anymore. Um, we need to sell. We, need, we, we are in the business of connecting buyers with sellers. And who are the buyers? Your guests that come through your gate, your racers. Here's another interesting opportunity, business to business. Um, I, I put together an ice cream deal with Velvet Ice Cream. They pay us $25,000 a year to be the official ice cream of Summit Motorsports Park. And part of the deal was I needed to try to get them shelf space in C stores and other local and, and grocery stores that we had partnerships with. So look at business to business opportunities. If you have a up and coming solvent company, a blaster, um, a penetrant, whatever it could be anything. If you have a Napa partnership or if you have an advance or a zone partnership. Um, probably not so much with some of those majors, but maybe a federated or maybe a local parts store. Maybe you can help get shelf space in a local parts store for that company that is so desperately looking for shelf space and recognition and branding. So you have partnership opportunities right within your existing core of sponsorship right now that you don't even know. So look at how to maximize, how to be opportunistic. Um, Everywhere I go, I'm looking for a potential sponsor. And I love non-traditional sponsors. Um, I stay away from alcohol and tobacco. Um, I stay away from casinos. Um, I, I, try to fi I try to find mom and pop, not mom and pop, but family-oriented, consumer, big box, um, non-traditional partners. You know, you're out looking for sponsorships you got to identify what you're looking for. I mean, in reality, there's two types of, call them sponsors, call them advertisers. I always thought sponsors were donators and advertisers or advertisers, but anyhow, we'll call them sponsors. There's two types of sponsors that you're going to go out and look for. One's the emotional sponsor, one's the rational one. And the difference is the emotional one, that's the guy that just wants to buy the three by eight sign for a thousand bucks because he wants his name there. It's fun for him to go to the races and see my name and that's takes part ownership in that. The rational sponsor, he's the guy that actually expects to get a return. He'll give you $100,000. You just got to show him how he's going to make $125,000 off of that. So when you're targeting your advertisers and sponsors, you know, keep in reality what you're really going after. If it's mom and pop clothing store, you know, that just loves racing or big race fans, that's going to be more of an emotional deal. And a lot of times what works for the emotional advertiser is ticketing packages and just fun stuff like that to keep them involved. But don't overlook that with your bigger advertisers also because we've got some large, large ones. When I say large, you know, the ten to $25,000 advertisers, they love the ticketing packages because they give them to their employees for, you know, work safe incentives, 
We won't miss any work incentives, sales incentives. They give them out their key customers too because it's a way to thank their customers for their loyal uh, spending with them. Part of, uh, I had a thought here I was going to run by you that, um, hmm, what was it? Oh, I know what it was. Like I said earlier, one of my philosophies is be the customer. One thing I saw, it started about two years ago, we started to see a decline in advertisers at our racetrack because I got the same story from a bunch of them. Well, we're going to pull back a little bit here because we're starting to move it over there. Where were they moving it? They were moving it into the digital and social media world. It's like, crap. Well, I do the same thing. I've pulled a lot of money back from newspapers and radio stations, and I'm putting it more in the digital and social media world. Okay? Well, then give them that. Grow your social media following. You know, we're over 30,000 followers and stuff now. So part of my package I take to them now, it's no longer the traditional signboard, program ad, PA mentions, you know, stuff like that. What we take to them now is that we've got this strong social media platform that when you're dealership is having your tent sale this summer, let us help advertise that for you. When your restaurant's running a two-for-one special, let us get that word out to our 30,000 plus people to drive traffic to you. So we become the extension of their advertising, no different than when they contract through their local radio station or newspaper for the digital advertising and the social media stuff they're doing. We're bringing that package to them also as part of our package. So a lot of what they're buying doesn't happen at the racetrack anymore. It goes way beyond the borders of the walls of your racetrack. So you want to really look at where you're spending your money and create a platform like that so when you're asking people to spend money with you, you're bringing them the same product. I think these guys just hit on some great, you know, objectives, topics, and, and if you're not taking notes about this whole meeting, you know, again, feel free to, to check back with us or other people, but, you know, they hit on every every he's always looking for sponsors i mean i find myself doing that if i'm watching a, a college basketball game or a pro football game you know why is papa john's here why is state farm here why is all this those people are all trying to get their message out and then there's the aspect of b2b we're starting to do a lot more b2b you know can we get on the shelf space can we do this then there's the, the aspect of the community for the, for the facilities that have a local dealership, a car dealership that want to do incentives with their service department. They want to uh, get a free ticket with a test drive, you know, or a, a, a factory that won't, you can do a HR deal with the employees. So there's three or four different levels of this that we, we really chase. And um, you just have to distinguish and know which one you're chasing with that customer. I say that a lot to my guys, is it, is it a customer? You have to know or have an idea of what their budget is when you go in. You have to think like, what, what can we do that will really benefit them? Is it gonna be an emotional play? Is it gonna be a complete um, numbers play? Or is it gonna be a complete B2B? Or is there some combination? So a lot of that. What I wanted to finish with though, is something no one's touched on. Just because you get that person and you do a celebration, the repeat is sometimes a little more difficult. Make sure you provide them with the data of what they got, um, the newsletter you're sending out. Definitely a, build that personal relationship with that person too. But always remember, they have to feel good about it, A. They have to think they got something out of it. And a lot of them have to report to their boss of why they're doing it. Or if they are the boss, they've still got to report to their wife why they're doing writing that check. So they have to feel good about it at the end of the day, after the second, third, fourth year. And then you have that for a long time. Then you can spend more effort on going and getting the new ones. The new ones are probably more difficult. Keeping them, keeping them are, is, is easy, but you have to do it. Just don't take that $1,000 check or the $25,000 check and then send them an invoice and you're done because you will lose them pretty quickly. I also just want to make the point that, it, you know, just – if you're a smaller racetrack, that doesn't, de you know, deter anyone from the, the same thing. You know, the sponsorship numbers might be different, um, but getting those sponsors are just as easy because there's, there are a lot of the emotional uh, buys, you know, and, and that comes back to your sportsman racers. There's a lot of those sportsman racers that are, you know, business owners and things like that, or, you know, they want to be able to have uh, representation there. Um, you know, so I think that just identifying who, you are as a racetrack and what level of sponsorship you can give back. Um, I think that's the key. You can still sell plenty. Uh, if you're three bait sign, 
is maybe 750 bucks, whatever that is, depending on how big of shows that you have. But I think there are a lot of that out there. That's that's all your low hanging sponsorship that is really quick and easy to get, and that's as easy as track signage, you know, just along the guardrails, you know, anything like that. There's there's so much of that. The one piece I will say is, um, I think it's really important as well to give them uh, the respect for the the money that they've spent and spend the time to make sure that you've done it right. Quick story here: I the racetrack that I bought last year, I was that emotional sponsor. Just you know, hey, I wanted to give back to the racetrack, so I sponsored the racetrack for a guardrail sign the guardrail sign had the wrong phone number on it <laughs> told him about it stayed that way for the whole year <laughs> you know and i'm like you know so i'm like what what kind of representation is that ah, i bought the racetrack so i get my phone number right but <laughs> there were less expensive ways to do that tommy um a couple comments um i i had a meeting once i walked into the ohio lottery the ohio lottery um was dis disenchanted with their partnership with the NFL. I knew they were disenchanted. I also knew they were used to seeing NFL numbers, not Norwalk Raceway numbers. So I took three proposals with me, each at a different dollar amount. Um, why did I do that? Well, when you're talking to a guy that's used to spending um, a half a million to three quarters of a million dollars for a scoreboard sign at Cleveland Brown Stadium, all of a sudden my ten or $15,000 package He's just not going to think there's value there because it's so inexpensive. I took, a, I took a 15, I took a 40, and I took a 60. I, I spent, I looked around the office. I, I got to know a little bit about, his name was Bill Snow. Um, I, I got to know about, I mean, it, an office is representative of the person you're meeting. If there's a bunch of fish and wildlife on the walls, he's a hunter. Um, you can learn a lot about a person and you immediately start to massage that conversation to find some common ground or some interest. Long and the short of it is after about 30 minutes, he said, did you bring a proposal? I said, I sure did. I pulled the one in the middle and sold him that day on the one in the middle. Um, I didn't want to get greedy. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to lowball him. So I pulled, they were all three identical proposals. You just had a different contract page. Um, and um, so just do some work to understand who you're talking to, what their appetite is, and where they've been, okay, where they've spent their money. Um, secondly, don't – I have sat in meetings, and, I, and I've said to the gentleman or, or the female, I've said, listen, we don't have anything for you. Yeah, but I want to spend money. And I'm going to say, you're going to spend money with me one year. And you're, and you're going to be completely dissatisfied, and you're not going to come back. I can't do anything for you. I can't sell moon rocks at my racetrack or whatever it is, their, whatever their product is. Um, so I, I would rather shut down a deal. Sometimes the best deal is the one you never do, rather than sitting there a year from now being chastised because you didn't move the needle for a potential partner. Um, so I think it's important to remember that, that if you don't believe in your heart, we're not whores and we're not just out there. We, we should believe in every deal we do. We should believe that we can move the needle for a partner. Um, and I think there's a certain amount of integrity uh, and that translates to retention because um, retention is important. So I, I think those two things, um, a year-end recap, um, a Christmas card, a handwritten thank you, uh, something nice at Valentine's Day. Um, uh, my sister Bobby does Easter baskets for certain sponsors at Easter time. She runs cookies all over the place. Um, these are personal relationships. These are not business deals, okay? These are personal. Um, a, a binder, each sponsor gets a binder at the end of the year, every time their name appeared. It may have been in the Norwalk Reflector, it may have been in the USA Today, it may have been in a um, in West Buck's book. It may have been in Dragster. Um, impressions, eyeballs. Um, those recaps, they are laborious. They're time-consuming. They're a pain in the butt to do. They are invaluable. When you give a sponsor, and, and, and listen, I'm busy. If you can't say what you need to in a sentence, I'm zoned out. True story. If somebody sends me an email 10 pages long, I delete the email. Man, land your plane. Get it down in a sentence or two, okay? Um, or you will lose me. 
But if you take a sponsor a binder that thick, they're not going to look at it, but they're, you know what they're going to think? Holy cow, I got my money's worth at Summit Motorsports Park. Now, if you want to get cute, you can put something on the first three pages and just put blank paper and the rest of it, I don't know. But you find out who's reading it. Um, but um, my point is quantify the dollars that were spent because they're looking for a return. And, and return translates in every time their name appears, every commercial they appeared in, every impression, every press release, everything. Even if it's little and inconsequential, somebody's eyeballs saw their name, and it's important. All right, I'm going to uh, open it up to you guys. If you have any questions and you want to ask them anything, anybody talk about your comments. I have is I'm out of Knoxville. We have so much going on. How do we get them to our track instead of going to Tennessee football, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, all the football, basketball, everything. How do we get them there? Because there's so much stuff going on in that area. First thing you want to do is think like them. Think like your customer. If you were that customer going to all these football games, all this other stuff, what would it take you to get off the couch and come to your racetrack? And you know, don't try for the home run. Just get a single. You know, get 10 people, then get 15, then get 20. Because your best advertise you're going to get from the sounds of things that's going on there is going to be word of mouth. And people say, man, you got to go out and try this guy's racetrack or whatever the name of your track is. But you know, just but think like if you're that person doing that, what would it take to get you to come out? You know, and I, I spoke at a promoters conference a few days ago, and one of the things I was asked about was couponing and stuff. And you know, I've never had a lot of success with doing a two dollar off your ticket or five dollar off your ticket coupon unless you're using it at a sponsor location to draw customers into a store. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I have no interest in going there because I like doing what I'm already doing. You got to give them something that's going to go, hey, uh, that's something I want to see. You know, so you got to give them something that's going to pique their interest to where they don't go to that football game or that flea marker or whatever they're doing. Give them something that's going to pique their interest to get them into your racetrack and then reach them, figure out how to reach them. But think like that customer. If you were that customer sitting in this area of town on your couch, what would make you want to drive across town come to my racetrack and, and that's what's going to take to get them in there. Just start small and work out from there. One, <clears throat> one thing that we've seen on the drag strip side is the social media side's getting stronger. The, the marketing buys are going different, different rates. On the oval track side, the dirt track side, are you guys seeing the same thing? Are you seeing social media being the stronger market now instead of the TV, the radio? Because what the strong thing that I see is, like, when I jump in my truck, I turn on XM radio. I'm not turning on local radio. Well, when I turn on my television, I'm going to DirecTV. I'm going to ESPN. I'm not going to the, to, the, to the local market. You know, and that might be my default, but are you guys seeing that the social media side, because when you click Facebook, everybody's got the same Facebook. Are you guys seeing that as well as me, or am I just out in left field? If, if you talk to... NHRA national event facilities, or if you talk to those NHRA facilities that have NASCAR races, they are converting dollars from electronic, i.e. TV, radio, to digital. Digital marketing, not social. There's a difference. So they are taking money out of radio and TV, and they are putting it into digital marketing because digital marketing can give you this nice and tidy report at the end of the spend that says you spent X, we gave you Y. And they can do that through those pixels that follow the transaction from the click to the sale. Um, TV can't do that for us. Radio can't do that for us. Um, so digital, in my opinion, to some degree, is the new toy in the toy box because they can quantify. But we are seeing large conversions uh, we just I just came from the NHRA national event meeting, and there was discussion. You talked to Scott Paddock at Chicagoland. I don't know what you're doing, Casey, at Indy or at the NHRA tracks, but 
tracks are taking money out of radio and TV and putting it into digital marketing. Absolutely. So here's your problem, our problem. You just said that you don't listen to Sirius X FM or you look at your Facebook. This older gentleman right here probably doesn't have Facebook, and he probably doesn't listen to Sirius XFM. That's exactly. <laughs> I, I know, okay, picked on him, but I do know people <laughs> like that. You know, they're still reading the newspaper. So I think we said that I said this at the very start. The problem that we have now is you have to do it all. Allocating your dollars is the only you can control. Everything else, you can't control what these people are looking at. You can try to quantify it. And as he was just talking about what NHRA is doing, and, and we deal a lot with Menards. We have to do some co-op dollars. They absolutely will not look at digital. They want to know what we did on the radio. So I, I think what's in my mind right now, and I, I hate it's probably not politically correct, I don't know that anyone has that answer yet. I, and I'm not at the top of the level by any means, but I'm in, I feel like I'm more in the field. And I hear from the smartest people in the world. I hear everything from the other day. We were in a business conference. They had a 25-year-old gal there, and she was saying that even the combustible engine isn't going to be a factor anymore. I mean, she was really on the other edge. But my point there is there is all the way the extreme that right now. And I think the only thing you can do is use that to our advantage. Take that as a, a great thing. It's just a little more work, a little more um, – Thinking about it, as, as we said 20 years ago, we all had a cookie-cutter deal. We went in and we bought the country station on radio, We $2 cable plus spots, and that was all we did, you know, maybe a newspaper ad. Now it's just not going to be that easy. I don't think there is an answer. One thing with our small, I call them small community racetracks, not your big major super speedways, um, don't overanalyze it. Don't overthink what you're doing. I mean, there's some very simple old-fashioned guerrilla marketing that still works, just like the gentleman over here said. You know, he goes to ESPN and he listens to Sirius Radio. If you're in my area and you listen to Sirius Radio and you don't buy the newspaper, how do you know about Skagit Speedway? One of my most basic philosophies that's worked very well for me is roadside signage. And I don't mean your big billboards. Those are okay, but they're expensive. We, we make four-by-four four signs. You know, we got some that are 32 by 4 because I get three of them out of a 4 by 8 piece of material. We go around our different sponsors that have stores on busy highways, and they let us put signs out on the edge of the road. We'll, we'll stop at a farmer and trade him out season tickets. He's on a busy highway to put a, a sign on the edge of his property. We've even gone into businesses that we don't even know who they are and say, look, you let me put my sign out here, I'll give you a free sign on my racetrack. Give them a little four by eight sign. You always got room for that. Some basic, simple stuff like that because if you're listening to XM and you don't read the paper, you're driving around, you're going to see the sign boards. We probably put out close to 20 a year in a three-county area on all the major busy highways. And we allows us even on the bottom part to put uh, – additional signage on the bottom of your next big upcoming event and stuff. We get more comments from people that have seen our signs around town like that than anything else. That's a brilliant idea, and I just made that note. Um, there's a gentleman back there who wants to ask a question, but I want to, oh, I'm sorry. You're, um, I want to answer, I, I want to comment real quick, because you asked an important question. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. Number one, um, partner with some of those folks. Some of those folks that you think are attracting all of, all of these prospects, partner with them. Ticket deal, partner. Um, and maybe it's not with the University of Tennessee volunteers, but maybe it's with some of those minor league venues that you can partner with. Set up a meeting in the offseason. See how you can work together. I've had some success doing that um, with partnering with some of those folks. Um, the other thing is you can offer a value message the Tennessee Volunteers do not sell value, okay? That's a cult. And they charge, they, it is, it is a cult. And they charge accordingly. Um, and so you've got all of these folks that can afford that cult price tag. In my mind, you, you, your messaging is value, family entertainment, value, um, and all of the things that are going to be um, good food, um, midway, clean facility, well-lit parking lots, whatever your sell items are to attract families, um, that's the value message. Guarantee your experience. We, we feel so strongly that your family will have a good time that we guarantee it. And if not, we'll give you your money back. 
Um, the other thought is, you know, you had Coke and you had Pepsi. You had these two 800-pound gorillas. What did 7-Up do? Do you remember what 7-Up messaging was? They were the Uncola. They said, you know what? We don't want to be Coke. We don't want to be Pepsi. They used differentiation to become successful. They're not as big as Coke or Pepsi, but they've got a heck of a share. So don't be afraid to be different to and use differentiation to communicate your message. Those types of things will translate. How do you guys feel about putting cl uh, classes back in uh, to drag racing? Uh, uh, most of you guys are too young to remember uh, the foundation of what we have today. Um, Stone Woods and Cook. Uh, Big John Masmanian, Virgil Cates, Ohio George Montgomery. These were all people that we as youngsters aspired to be like. And uh, I don't can't think of a kid that wants to aspire to be like Stanley the Bracket Racer. And I think if we get classes back into drag racing, this whole sport is built on our ego. Keep in mind, we're starting to see that with Heads Up Racing. Heads up racing is class racing. Small tire racing, outlaw racing. The problem is we need to remember why um, class racing died. It got expensive. Um, and, and, and I believe in my heart that we're going to see this heads up movement come and go because we're not managing cost. Um, because it's the haves and the have nots. Um, my PR person, Mary Lenzen, used to run in Ultra Street, and she was a competitive car 10 years ago. And there were 50 and 60, and, I mean, there were a ton of Ultra Street cars back in the day. How many are there now? A fraction. Why? Because there's a handful of guys or a handful of racers that can put up big numbers and the rest can't compete. So they, now, Mary still has her car. It's parked in her garage. But the point is, we, buy our, we are a society of excess. Why have 10 when you can have 20? Why have one when you can have two? Why, you know, I mean, we supersize, right? We supersize. We, now a beer is not in a 16 ounce. You can get these monster cans. I mean, everything we do, go faster, be stronger, be prettier, um, eat more, blah, blah, blah. We, we are excess. And I've seen that with junior dragsters. I mean, when you've got transporters bringing in a junior dragster, for God's sakes, what the hell is wrong with that picture? Um, so... My, 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 I guess my point is um, we have got to manage these programs. We've got to manage speed, keep them affordable. Um, and and we, we seem to always fail to do that. And then we act in haste and we repent in leisure and say, wow, the horse is out of the barn. Um, in hindsight, was the delay box really a good idea for drag racing? Was a down track throttle stop really a good idea? Um, I'm sure NASCAR is looking at some of what they're doing. As I mean, it, <laughs> the car of tomorrow, Toyota's involvement, the restrictor plate. Um, I mean, to me, there there are some things that that just don't make sense, but you don't realize it until it's too late. I just want to tell you a real quick story. Talking about keeping costs on your cars and why we're losing race cars, why things are going away. Just talking with Jeff from Spire. Uh, the other night, they're the ones that just bought out Furniture Row Racing. Furniture Row Racing, they won the championship a year ago. Their budget this year to race on, he said, was $42 million. There's a reason why that team quit. So don't, that's a big scale, but don't let that happen on a small scale of your racetrack. Cost controls are so important. I mean, you're going to take some grief from your big dollar guys that are going to hound you to let them buy expensive stuff, but you just got to keep control on it. Uh, the question is, we, it's a little bit off topic, but it's still there, it's related. We own a track, okay, so, and we, but we are a vintage racing association, and what we have, our problem is getting drivers in the seat, okay, because the Millennials and the Gen X, they're doing other things, they're doing this. We cannot attract enough drivers to, f to get on the track 
to show an event. We don't even charge admission to come to the track for the spectators, and our, and our race fees are very low, $300 for a weekend. We can't get those, guy, the, those kids to fill our seats, and us being all old farts are disappearing, and we don't have, and we don't have anybody to replace them. Got any suggestions? No, it's just a process, I think. Um, you're not as unique as you think you are. We at the local dirt tracks have seen our car classes from, you know, just say a, a certain division would be in the 30s or 40s down to the 10s and 15s. So we're losing 50% of ours also. Um, cost containment is a big thing. And you hit on something about the millennials and the people on their games in their basement and everything. That's a much more intricate problem and issue that we have and, and it's something again as, as society is changing we have to go market to those kids and get them out there and make it exciting the business conference we were in the other day we're talking about e-racing and all that, that they're doing on the computer sim racing we just have to be smart enough to figure out how to get those young people the young boys and girls <laughs> interested in coming out to the real event and seeing it but again, I think it started with affordability as far as our racing divisions. They have to be able to afford it, and then they have to be able to relate to it, which again, some things are out of our control. We know kids aren't changing carburetors and working on the engines anymore, so it's not as easy, but it's still, it's still obtainable. It's just you have to figure out how to get the people interested in what you're trying to do, make it affordable. Probably the two biggest things you need to look at too is Obviously, with everything we do in life, is cost is a first factor. But people have money, they'll spend it if they're having fun. So, I mean, the other thing is you gotta look at the fun factor. Is it something fun for them to do? Is it something that piques their interest? You know, people will spend the money it takes to do it if they're getting the value of the enjoyment out of it. Another thing, in your case, an, an idea, they seem, the millennials seem to follow each other. You know, the Facebook, use that to your tool because here they see their friends doing it, or they see the excitement. So go after a couple of them. Get a couple excited and, and just introduce what you have to that age group, and they will probably spread their word for you. My question would have to do with, uh, is there bad media for a racetrack? Uh, a lot of facilities I go to, I am a media outlet myself, I live stream at events. Some facilities find it very positive and it gets people out there the next day if they didn't know of the event. Some people find that the live streaming uh, takes people out of the stands and they'll stay home instead of come to the track. Is there a balance between live streaming? This may not help as much for like an NHRA event, but a smaller grassroots style event. You know, that's interesting because this is a heavily debated topic and half of the people will say that it hurts attendance. The other will say that it doesn't. Um, I can tell you I'm 51 years old and when you sit home on a Ford, on a high def television and you can watch coverage of, a, of an NFL game or a collegiate football game or the Olympics, the coverage the 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 um, the in-depth commentary, the analysis, the statistical um, it, those things it, it makes it really hard to go sit at Cleveland Brown Stadium when it's 25 degrees and the wind chill is 10 below um, and and the team sucks um, w versus sitting at home and watching it on a high def TV. How, however, however, our sport does not translate worth a damn on TV. Our, we are a visceral sport, and I don't care. I'm going to tell you something. I have never experienced turn one at a, world, at a sprint car or a super modified race. Man, when those wings drop and, and, and the green flag drops and everybody hits turn one, I, I mean, it's cool. And they can't, and that isn't captured on TV. So I am of the opinion that it does not hurt what we are doing. That is my opinion. 
You know, just this last year, we sanctioned the World of Outlaws out there in Washington, and they announced they were going to live stream all their races and with no revenue share. I mean, that upset a lot of us because we were worried the same thing. You know, is that can people going to sit home and watch it on TV? And and I, I got to be honest with you, I was against it. But I don't know if it's because of what we're doing with marketing or what. But our crowds were up this year. They were up last year, but they were up good this year. So the the jury's still out on that. I think where you're going to see that that's going to hurt us is what it's done to NASCAR. My personal opinion is that they're doing such a good job with the TV now. Why would I want to have to spend a few thousand dollars from my area to go to a NASCAR race when I can stay home and eat Cheetos in my easy chair watching a good coverage on TV? So right now, some of the live streaming isn't good enough to where I'm going to want to stay home. I'm going to go to the local track and experience it. That could change down the road when they start getting the production a lot better to where a person doesn't want to drive 40, 50, 60 miles because the production is so good of what they're getting at home with all the behind the scenes stuff. So it's the jury's still out on that, on where it's going with that, to be honest with you. The other issue there is that as a track promoter, when we're selling corporate America to it, corporate America wants as many eyeballs as they can get. So there's a whole other issue. We have to look at the ticket sales and we have to look at corporate America. Uh, you know, some of the, the street racing and all that, you know, or the, the, um, uh, the, the people that are doing the exciting things and getting all those views, you know, corporate America really likes that. So there's a whole other issue to look at for us. If, you're gonna, if they're going to be at an event or they're going to live stream your event and stuff, make sure you get this, the statistics. I mean, sometimes they're afraid to give you the statistics because you don't want to go, okay, you had 20,000 people watching times $39. You guys made this much money. I want my cut. But you got to get those statistics because then you go to your sponsor and say, look, there was 20,000 people watching our live streaming of this event that's going to see your brand out there. So, you know, take something that could be a little bit of a negative and put a spin on it and find the positive in it to where you can take what they're doing and sell it to increase your revenue on the backside. You may not have the people in the grandstands if a few of them stay home, but if you can pick up some advertising dollars and some exposure to your racetrack, it's probably going to be a benefit. You guys have, all have great, great points about having a track and, and who's your customer and who's your guest when they come through the front gate. We took over Tucson Dragway three years ago and quickly learned that after 35 years of, of NHRA racing myself, I was ready to, like you're saying in the back, you know, teach people how to throttle stop race, people teach people how to bracket race, and that's not what they wanted to do. And so we listened to our customer base brought in Matt DeYoung, young man, 26 years old. Um, proud to say he just uh, was nominated as uh, 30 under 30 uh, for West Bucks deal yesterday. And, and, and get, you have to engage the new crowd out there. So we got involved in a, an alternative to street racing called Beyond 1320. We go down past the finish line and we, we have a race down there. We're bringing in 1,500 people on a Friday night that come out to watch 40 to 50 cars race with half the lights on, no prep, and it emulates street racing. And now the, the community likes it because we've given them an alternative to street racing. So the one point I wanna make is listen to your crowd, listen to your, 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 your customer at what they want. Think time, times are changing. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Kristen and, and this group again. This is the best seminar second year in a row to go to. It's re it really is excellent. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments also. One on the live feed, because we did it this about three years ago we started doing that. And at first I was concerned as well, but I had to say to myself and look in the mirror and say, if my product's not good enough and not exciting enough, where if somebody happens to be in the local area that they're not going to come out and watch it in person, and they're going to sit and watch it in live feed, then I'm either overpriced or I don't have a good product. So I stopped worrying about that, and it caused us to sharpen our pencil and do even better. Um, also want to make a comment about uh, data capturing. I hope maybe next year you guys can talk more about that, because when you buy radio ads, you buy cable TV ads, you're basically renting your customer. But if you can capture their data at the track, you're owning the customer. I watch companies like Summit racing who used to advertise in hot rod and car craft and all those magazines i used to work for peterson publishing they don't do near as much today because they sent the catalog for free to get the customer's information they own it 
now you can, you can market to that person every single time. Uh, we're trying some new things next year, like advanced ticket sales, even with a discount slightly. And, and we, we asked ourselves, well, why would you be willing to give yourself a little bit of a haircut? And the person who's helping with this said, helping us with this said, you, when they buy online from you, you now have their email address, you now own them. Next year, you're not wondering who they are, you know who they are. So I, I hope maybe data capturing can become a, a greater topic in the future. Well, you know, just to comment um, uh, on what Steve said, the, the, if we're not all capturing data uh, at our racetracks, shame on us. Um, name, address, city, post Great Recession, when everybody stopped sending mail, we started sending, we, we maintained mail. We direct mail to households multiple times a year uh, with big, oversized, bold, colorful stuff. And what I'm, what I'm finding is our new mailbox is our inbox. I am not as bullish on email blasting as I once was. What do we all do? We're all busy. I manage about 150 emails a day from people, which is stupid. So I come in and I turn on my email and Runner's World and Lululemon and all this stuff pops up. Do you look at it or do you delete? Delete, 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 delete. Gee, that sounds familiar, just like junk mail in our mailbox. So um, I, I, I think, it, yes, we want an email address, but we still want a physical address. We want a phone number. Um, you know, we launched a phone app this June. Um, eventually, our number one way of communicating to people is going to be through this. It's tiny. It's convenient. It goes in your pocket. So to have an app um, where there's a data collection piece, everything we do, um, we should be trying to find qualified leads. The one thing I'm going to caution you on, when you do a free ticket event, okay, we did... We experimented with some free ticket events at the Cavalcade of Stars we do in May. And on the ticket, we asked for data. Um, we started doing matchback. Those people came out of the woodwork to come to an event. They were not our customer. They were not going to be a returning customer. And I was just wasting a ton of money direct mailing to them. So I think when you're looking for data collection, I, I, they need to be qualified leads, okay? So we just need to keep that in mind. In my opinion on the live feed, you know, drag racing and football and hockey. Hockey, you go to hear the ice. You hear the puck hitting. I mean, you don't get that experience on TV. When I go to the drag race, I smell the fuel. I smell the, you hear the burnt rubber. And I, it's a total different, you know, it's a sensory thing watching the TV or live. And I guess drag racing is the biggest, or any motorsport, you know, you're smelling that fuel. You're smelling the tire burn, you know. It's visceral. Um, when you can feel your chest get punched, when you, your eyes drain and your nose drains and you go home with crap in your hair. And I, I mean, I'm telling you that, I, I, there, <laughs> sprint car races, uh, super modified races, I mean, some cool stuff, and it can't be captured on television. I would say the re I, I, and I'm going to go way out on a limb here, I would say that the reason that some of us would rather capture a NASCAR race on TV versus live, it's a product problem. To some degree, it's a product problem. Um, and uh, I, I think we, we all need, core is king. We all need to remember who our core customer is. And we, we can't go wrong. Now, not that we're looking for fringe and not that we're looking for new, but we always need to remember where we came from. I just want to touch on a couple of things that were mentioned today and wrap it up as to what we're doing at the Jennerstown Speedway in Jennerstown, Pennsylvania, which is the middle of nowhere, okay, population zero. Uh, my nearest metropolitan area is Pittsburgh, which is an hour and a half away. The last two seasons, we've put over 100,000 people through our gates in 14 weeks. And a lot of people, I go into these seminars and they frown upon, they cringe when I tell them what we're doing. Um, you mentioned free ticket giveaways. I partnered with 26 school districts last year where I approached these school districts and offered rural communities. We're coal country, okay? Coal and farming is a big thing in our area. These people can't afford to go to NASCAR events. They can't even go to amusement parks. 
and we provide each of those students with complimentary tickets. Now, there's another, it's not solicitation, they're free, they're 100% free. But every one of my billboards at my Speedway is sold because when you have 4,500 to 5,000, 6,000 people a night, those sponsors figure out the cost per person and it just translates to big numbers for them. So I'm not making my money at the front gate, but I'm filling my stands, I'm making it the refreshments, I'm making it the souvenirs. And the gentleman over here said about the data collection, there are different softwares out there. I team up with uh, Tix.com, excellent program. I print all my tickets through them. They offer mail ordering. Uh, you can have printed home, e-ticket print, and you pass that fee along to the consumer. For every ticket I sell at my gate, it costs me a quarter. Every ticket I sell online costs $1.50, but if you go on any concert site, they're passing those fees along. People are associating that with anything they purchase now, so they don't mind that. We just announced the monster truck show, excuse me, monster truck show on uh, Thanksgiving Day. It has spread like wildfire. Our pre-ticket sales is bigger than any racing event we've done. We've had 30,000 hits that are now going and liking our page. So having these different events, bringing a different crowd in, we're hoping to bring back return fans and keep growing. But that ticket software, I now have everyone's email address. Uh, we use the rainedout.com app. We don't use it just for when we rain out a race and we put out our ticket promotions on rainedout.com. I got 9,000 people that follow that that may have not been at the track for two years, and there might be something that I can reach them on. So there's a lot of resources out there that they're intended for one person, one purpose, but we can spin them in something else. So You just made a good point, that's, and it gets back to this multi, multiple channel marketing concept. And by the way, I use ticks.com, and I pay a quarter and a buck 52. So I'm glad to know that they charge each of us the same amount. So I uh, feel good about that. Comp tickets are free, by the way. Yes, so comp tickets. So those tickets that I distribute to those school districts, yeah, which those are, are in thousands of amounts, yeah. are 100% free. It costs me .001 cent to print a ticket. Okay, so that's cheap. So, and then one other thing I want to elaborate on. Uh, you mentioned about direct mail. We did a free ticket Friday. Now, I just told you we're giving away thousands of tickets. I'm getting anywhere between a 25 and 30% return. Those are incredible numbers, okay? Now, that has to do with the scale and how many you put out there. You, know, you have kids 12 and under are free, so that factors into that. We did a free ticket Friday. 18,000 people engaged in that post. I got 60 at the gate. The biggest complaint, like you said, it, they feel it's either junk mail or they don't have a printer at home. And we even said, well, bring it on your phone. You can show us your phone. People figured, oh, I can't print it out, I can't use it. So there's different things, that, obstacles that we need to overcome that never would have thought of that. I figured everybody had a printer, but they don't have that ability to print those coupons and so on and so forth. Think about hoops and barriers to entry. When we all do what we do, um, I, I'm not a big fan or a big proponent of discounting, um, but you know, this idea of, gee, go to your local store and get a discount, that's a barrier to entry because it's a hoop. Um, if we're going to throw discounts out there, a $2, a $3, I'm not sure a $5 discount moves the needle anymore. Maybe that's the minimum, but probably closer to 7 to 8 to 10. Um, but everything we do, everything we create, we need to think about the barriers to entry and the hoops that we're making our guests jump through. The trade show today. I want to thank all you guys for coming out here. It's important you learn this stuff. Thank you.